Hello everybody and welcome to this AHDB presentation where I'm going to be introducing the Maternal Matters campaign and also talking about why maternal traits are so important in the suckler herd and I'll also be acknowledging a lot of my uh, Nuffield farming scholarship uh, findings where I looked at what we need to do as an industry to ensure we have a long uh, term sustainable future. So my name is Sarah Penrose and I work in the beef and lamb uh, knowledge exchange team at AHDB. If you have any particular questions on uh, what I discuss over the next 15 minutes or so, please do drop me a message. Um, so my email address is Sarah, so S -A -R -A -H, dot Penrose, which is P-E-N-R-O-S-E -E, at ahdb.org.uk. And I look forward uh, to hearing from you. So I always like to start when I'm talking about um, why maternal traits are so important by asking this question. So what do we think has the biggest impact on profits in the suckler herd? Do you think it's growth rate? Do you think it's carcass traits? Or do you think it's fertility? Now, I'm sure you won't be surprised by me doing this presentation, but it is, of course, fertility. Now, fertility is actually five times more important than growth rate and 10 times more important than carcass rates to the suckler producer. Now, I'm a bit of a numbers geek um, and I love number crunching BCMS data and what that can show us as an industry. And actually, only 82% of suckler cows in England are producing a calf every year. So that means we've got 18% of cows that aren't doing anything for us apart from eating uh, expensive feed. So we really, really, as an industry, need to focus on our maternal traits. I think we've done a great job of improving our terminal traits. So some of the finishing animals that we're producing are top quality. But I think it's now time we focused on what we need our suckler cows to do to ensure they are profitable. And as one uh, suckler producer said to me, he said, there's no point focusing on the growth rates if you haven't got the calf in the first place. And that really, really stuck with me. So, as I said, um, I did a Nuffield Farming Scholarship in 2019. For those of you who haven't heard of Nuffield Farming, it's basically where you get a pot of money to go out, to travel, to explore a project, and then you have to come back and tell everybody about it. So the whole agricultural industry benefits. So as part of my uh, scholarship, I was lucky to travel to Brazil, I travelled to Canada, uh, the US, New Zealand, as well as countries uh, closer to home. So I spent a lot of time in Europe as well. And it really didn't matter where I was in the globe, but the same things kept coming up. And that was always a focus on the maternal traits. And that really stuck with me. All their breeding policies were focused on um, maternal performance. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I saw. As you can see, there were very different cows wherever I was, um, but there were key things that ran through all those suckler herds. And I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So, as I said, we all have uh, cows in our heads that we know are our good cows. They always perform well year after year. But actually, what are those traits that we're looking for at home and the producers are looking for that I visited across the world? What are all those things that they're, they're focusing on that make a good suckler cow? Well, this is my kind of wish list that I came up with after my year uh, long travel. Don't worry, I wasn't traveling every year, but when I started and finished, it was about 12 months. So what I found was that really we don't want a fancy suckler cow. We just want one that's functional. And I think there's four key traits uh, within that. So the first one is calves at uh, two years of age. 
the second one is weans a calf every 365 days. So again, that fertility trait. The third one is low maintenance costs. And this is always an interesting one. Because basically what that's saying is we want a suckle cow that will thrive off grass and forage alone. We don't want to be shoving expensive concentrates down her, which really makes sense. And the final one is that she remains in the herd for at least five years. Now, why, why is five years kind of the magic number? Well, that's because I, I am uh, banking on that within those five years, she's had three calves, if she's calved at two. Um, and actually, a, a cow needs to produce three calves before she covers um, the cost it was to rear her um, and her, her kind of development costs to get her to being a cow. In the dairy herd, the uh, cow actually covers her cost within the first lactation. Um, with it, however, within the suckler herd, it is much longer than that. So you're really looking at, at three calves. So longevity is really important. So let's talk a little bit more about those. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit more about those in a bit more detail. So cow type. Now, um, I always find this really interesting. I know when I was traveling, I kept looking at what what kind of cows are they looking for? And these are some really great examples. So this cow on the left hand side is a beef booster. And really, she's a she's a hybrid cow, so uh, consists of many different um, breeds. And um, that uh, farmer uh, was really focusing on fertility, milk, weight, confirmation and hardiness. So he really wanted a cow that was going to withstand um, the climatic conditions where he was and also um, uh, thrive in those conditions as well. So when I visited, um, so that was in August and as you can see, the, the ground was parched. So it was about 30 degrees that day. And as you can see, you know, she looks really well and the calves uh, were really well as well. Um, and it was interesting. It was 30 degrees that day. He's then told me in winter it gets to minus 30 and these cows are still out. So they really have to work and be fitted to that system. And you think, oh, well, you know, the reproduction won't be great then. Well, actually, he was achieving a 93% conception rate in a 55 day breeding period. So it really shows what's possible. And again, this heifer on the top right, she's a maternalizer. So again, another hybrid or, or composite. And she had many different breeds within her. So there was Red Angus, Tarantaise, uh, South Devon, Red Paul, Hereford and Devon. Again, all chosen for the for the traits they exhibit. So really focus on those uh, fertility traits as well as kind of that hardiness and, and, and the traits associated with maintenance cost. And again, achieving a 94% conception in 48 days, which is incredible absolutely incredible and i think what really struck me was it, it isn't i think sometimes here we we find a cow or a breed that we like and we make the system fit that cow however what i saw and you'll see it across the globe is they have a system and they find a cow that fits that system and I think sometimes that's where we go wrong. And as Stephen Sanderson said, who's a, a Scottish uh, beef farmer, he said, if you don't have the right cow, it's like trying to walk uphill in high heels. And I wonder if he's actually tried that. So going back to those uh, functional traits, the first one I'm going to talk about is calving at two years. Now, when I first applied uh, to do my Nuffield Farming Scholarship, I really wanted to focus on calving at two. So um, I'd been working at HDB a couple of years and presenting to many farmers about um, the benefits of calving at two. And they kept coming back with the same concerns, which are fair enough. 
you know they were things like getting the heifer to the right weight for breeding um, worries about calving difficulties and also concerns about getting that newly calved heifer to rebreed so she calves within 365 days. So I thought, right, I'm going to apply for a Nuffield Farming Scholarship. I'm going to go out, find what other countries are doing and bring that information back so we can ensure it's successful here. So my first stop on my uh, travels was the Canadian Research Council in Canada. So I arrived there, you know, really, really enthusiastic about my topic and I explained what it was and they looked at me as if I had two heads and said, we've been carving at two years since the 1970s and it really is a business focused decision. So financially, you know, you're saving £600 a heifer by carving her at two rather than three. Production wise, that heifer that calves at two rather than three, she's producing more calves and more calf weight over a lifetime. And finally, she will remain in the herd longer. And that's because by, by calving them at two, you're indirectly selecting for your most fertile heifers. So it makes sense that she's more likely to remain in the herd because she's more fertile and will get in calf year, year after year. Now, the only thing that's missing from this slide is the environmental aspect. Now, we know there's a lot of talk about methane emissions and environmental impact of, of cattle. And actually, some research in Ireland has recently found that um, by calving heifers at two rather than three, you're actually saving around, oh, just over 10% of her emissions. So it really, really is worthwhile having a go if you can. But as I said, it isn't just a case of, you know, chucking the bull in at, when those heifers are 15 months of age. It really does take additional management. So it isn't right for every system. It isn't right for every farm. But if you think it will fit your system, it's definitely worth having a go. And so as part of my Nuffield, like I said, I wanted to focus on, on carving at two. Over time, my Nuffield actually got bigger and it was looking at what, as an industry, do we need to do to ensure we have um, a long term future? But focusing specifically on carving at two, the things that I found were key to ensuring it was successful are a focus on genetics. So this means when you're breeding your heifer replacements, make sure you're using a maternal focus bull. And I know sometimes that's quite tricky when you've got small herds and you only really want to use one bull. But I would say, we'll try and use AI try and use AI for, for your best cows to try and breed those maternal type heifers, which will do really well in your system. The second thing is selection. So it must be choosy. We shouldn't be keeping every single heifer. You know, look to see what are the traits you want in your herd. Which are, the, which are your best cows? You know, can we breed heifers from those to keep them? And finally, it's nutrition. So somebody said to me, you can't starve the profit out of them. We really need to make sure we're feeding um, them right. Even if you have to feed a little bit of concentrate during that first winter to get those breeding uh, weights, it honestly, it will pay off. Carving it too will pay off. And as somebody said to me, man has the greatest influence on any system. And the weakest part of any system is the man. So the next thing uh, I wanted to talk about is, of course, fertility. So going back to the to that cow weaning a calf every 365 days. And what I noticed was there was absolutely no room for sentimentality. If a cow or heifer did not conceive within a 60 day breeding season, they were called. There's no ifs, there was no buts. I know this is much easier when you're operating much larger numbers, but 
it should be easier for our, us to identify those poorer performing cows with smaller herds. And this is what these guys were doing. So <clears throat> these the heifers um, on the bottom, the, bit, the big picture, these are some heifers in Australia. Um, uh, these were maiden heifers, so before they were going to the bull. And as you can see, they didn't have a lot to eat, but they were expected to thrive within that system. And if they didn't get in calf, then they were down the road. The other photo on the top right, so this was a producer in um, Nebraska, and he had around 1,200 Simmental Cross Angus Suckler cows. And every year, he would get his uh, heifer replacement. So out of those 1,200 cows, say, for example, he got 600 heifers. Uh, I know it doesn't work like that, but we'll use that example. So he has 1,200 heifers. What he did is he didn't select any. He put every single, he AI'd every single heifer to one service. And anything not in calf after that time went down the line. It was put in the finishing pen. And he'd actually worked out that he was much better off letting that heifer go um, after he'd, he'd PD'd her than he was trying to get her in calf to sell her as, a two, as, a, as an in-calf heifer. And this really highlights the importance of, first of all, knowing your costs and knowing when to sell. And second of all, the importance of, of selection and making sure you're constantly selecting for that fertility. And the other thing I wanted to chat to you about is calving ease. Now, calving cows was not a thing. Um, it just really wasn't. Wherever I, um, I visited, they weren't calving cows. I think in the UK, we have just got used to it and it's just assumed that for you know a high proportion of our cows or heifers we carve them but that really shouldn't be the case you know if you think of the the time our time the cost sometimes if we have to get the vet and also um difficulties then getting those heifers or cows back in calf once we've um assisted them now I, uh, as part of my Nuffield, I went and uh, visited a ranch in uh, Florida called the Desiree Ranch. Now, they had 42,000 cows. Yes, that's right. And one cowboy to every thousand. And therefore, calving cows was just not an option. You know, a producer in the US told me that the USA would never accept the amount of dystocia there is in the UK. You know, we really, really need to dispel the, the misconception that a big calf is a sign of a good animal. It's really not. We need to use those EBVs and genetics to ensure we're producing um, uh, a small calf which grows like stink um, when it's born. And like I say, that's really where EBVs um, can be used. Now, mature size often gets people shuffling in their seats. And uh, there seems to be quite a lot of, of noise about it at the moment. And that's for good reason. So mature size is heavily correlated with uh, maintenance costs. So as you can see from this graph uh, on the screen now, you can see that there's, uh, there's the year at the bottom and the average weight up the uh, vertical axis. Now, the blue line is the average weight of steers. The red line is the average weight of heifers. The green line is the average weight of young bulls. And the purple line is the average weight of cows. And as you can see, across all four, it's been steadily increasing. And I really think it is something uh, we need to watch. And it has actually been increasing around two and a half kilos per year. So not only does uh, big cows, big suckler cows, mean um, uh, more uh, feed costs, but it also means with uh, the finishing animal as well, we all know the processors um, want um, 
a reasonably uh, sized uh, uh, carcass. They don't want a huge carcass. So we really just need to focus on it as an industry. Now, AHDB did some really good research a couple of years ago where they looked at what is the optimum cow mature weight in the UK. And what they found was it was around 680 uh, kilos. I don't know what you think to that. Um, that is much bigger than what I would see elsewhere. So most herds were looking at a, a 550 kilo cow. But what I can say is, if you don't weigh your cows, just um, have a look at your, if you've sent any cull cows in, and if you've got a weight, just have a look and just see where it is. It might be fine, um, but if you are looking at 750, 800 kilo cow, it might be time just to try um, and reduce that and save some feed costs. Now, that brings me to the end of, of my presentation. So uh, just to recap, as I say, suckler cows don't need to be fancy. They just need to be functional. So they need to carve at two. They need to wean a calf every 365 days, have low maintenance cost and remain in the herd um, for at least five years, producing three calves over that time. So I came back, I had all this information and um, I came back and uh, thought, right, I want to be able to tell industry about what I've learned. And that's why the Maternal Matters campaign was um, formed with the help of, of industry. So we've had um, a lot of, of companies involved with this campaign as well. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've set up a web page. So it's hdb.org.uk slash maternal dash matters, where we've put loads of information and tools on there about how you can improve the maternal performance of your herd. So please do go and have a look. Um, there's a number of, of webinars on there. Um, uh, videos um, as well as links to articles and things like that which should really help you um, uh, drive your, your business forward and really focus on those um, maternal traits so please please do go have a look at that web page and we're also quite active on social media as well so if any of you are on twitter or instagram um, please do follow the hashtag maternal matters so thank you ever so much um, if you've managed to listen all the way through this presentation um, really well done um, and I just kind of want to leave you with this question are your cows functional and if they're not how can you change that what do you need to do Thank you ever so much for listening. And like I say, if you have any questions about what I've discussed during this presentation, please do drop me an email at sarah.penrose at ahdb.org.uk.